Welcome. Today, so there's Jessica and I, and we are again exploring what leadership means today and what it might need in future. So, Scylla, your, your CV is kind of a bit breathtaking, so I, I'll, I'll um, be brief in introducing if you forgive me, but you, you worked for, for many years, I think something like 40 years on the sharp end of wars, and then became focused on uh, nuclear weapons and, and the whole thinking and, and the interactions between people who are involved in that. Three times you, you were nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for your work with the Oxford Research Group. And more recently, you've uh, written a, a, a great book, which actually arrived in the post today. <laughs> the Good. Big plan for peace and I, I'm, I'm shortening it right down because there's a whole series of chunks in, in uh, between that. We'll, we'll find out a little bit more as, as we go through. Um, so Scylla, welcome. Thank you for Thank you. being with us. Pleasure. I, I have kind of foreshortened things and, and not perhaps given a, a, a balanced view of your experience. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about the journey that's got you to where you are today? Uh, yes, I mean, from the time I was very young, I got um, life lessons that lasted me right until now. Uh, I had four big elder brothers, all older than me, all stronger than me. And when I was 11, they taught me to fire a shotgun. And I thought I was incredibly clever. And I took the gun out into the woods and I did something that was completely taboo. I saw a nest up in a tree. I stood underneath, pointed the gun upwards, and pulled the trigger. And down on my head came pieces of stick, pieces of shell, pieces of egg yolk, pieces of baby chick, and the sky blue feathers of a mother bird, which was a jay. And I was so shocked by what I had done and the violence of which I was capable that I took the gun back to the house and put it away and never touched it again. And that was sort of seminal. It really um, left me very little choice about what I did with my life because it was so then hardwired in me that uh, I had to do something about violence and I hadn't a clue how to set about it. But I was, uh, again, lucky because my mum took it seriously and sent me off when I was 16 to work in a holiday home for concentration camp survivors. And I sat on the grass all summer, peeling potatoes and listening to their experiences. Um, and that again ingrained in me a deep understanding of the debris of war, the, the human debris of war that lasts generations. And how one sniper squeezing his trigger and shooting somebody in the street who might be a baker would put that family out of action and probably cause those children to starve. So I'm, I've all my life been uh, uh, aware of what happens in war, although most of my family were in the military and, and they actually understand me very well now, but it took a while. Um, so, um, I think what I would say, um, well, just to quickly skip through, um, I became very um, enraged actually in the early 80s at the build-up of nuclear weapons and particularly at the fact that the British people weren't being told about the development of new weapons and it was simply announced in Parliament. And I thought that was wrong and unaccountable spending a fortune and, and using very, very tox highly toxic materials uh, on our behalf without telling us. So I set about finding out how nuclear weapons decisions are made and who makes them, not just in our country, but in all the then nuclear weapons nations. And gradually um, managed to bring the leading people together, be they physicists who design warheads or uh, intelligence people who set out the reasons why we need a new 
a new weapon system or the people who build the missiles and platforms to fire the weapons from or the military strategists who deploy them or the people who sign the checks and last of all the politicians and um, we were i set up a group in oxford a research group to document that and in 1986 we published our first book which was called how nuclear weapons <laughs> with diagrams of the whole process and how it works. So, um, I, I, and then I realized a lot about leadership, which I know is what, I, what you want to talk about. So let me pause there. <laughs> Thank you. When I, when I was sort of researching you, one, one of the things that struck me was Steve Jobs' um, commencement speech, which he gave in, at Stanford University in 2005, where he, 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 he reflects on the journey that he had had. And he said, you know, looking forward, you can't see how life uh, comes together. But he said, it's, a, it's only when you look back that you can s see how the dots were connected in the, the way that your, your life came together. Uh, and he said, you, you, you have to trust in something that the dots will somehow connect in your future. So looking back, what, what have you trusted in? Mm. Common sense, I think. Um, and um, the need to understand what's going on. Um, and um, now what I trust in is um communication that that it is possible to communicate and uh, enter a dialogue even with people with whom you profoundly disagree um and i believe that's one of the ways forward well you just talk we're talking about uh, communication uh, and you use the, the magical word dialogue and mm -hmm. it's something that uh, brought Jessica and I together really because that's a, a fundamental tenet uh, uh, um, of, of her work so um, mm -hmm. I don't know where you would like to take that. Well I suppose I was very struck when you said that we need spaces where people can disagree because we've just finished one conversation with that very sentiment that we, we've created societies and cultures where people are no longer free to disagree with each other. They have to feel that they are right and that they are unchallenged and that they have power over the other person. And I suppose what I love so much about the dialogue process, and I, I don't know what philosophy of dialogue you use in your work, but I follow Bohm dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. So the principles of that are very close to my heart in how we could go about our daily lives, you know, listening very deeply to understand without judgment, being curious and inquiring into our thoughts and our assumptions and our underlying values and beliefs and, and being able to move through disturbance. So being able to sit with people, listen to really what they're saying from their experience and, and noticing if it triggers anything in us and just being able to be with that and, and being able to move through that conflict and that disturbance to a place of deeper understanding. So not necessarily agreeing with them at the end, being able to walk away going, I still don't agree, but I understand and I see why you, you hold that belief or you think that thing because you've had that experience. And that's such a powerful transformational tool and something that we don't often give the time and space to. And I think that's some of the challenges that we've had is that people, the dialogue process is long, like to get to that deeper level of understanding, you have to sit with people and listen for long periods of time and, and time is money and so people and people are so used to wasting time in meetings whereas what we really have lost is the ability to come together and meet together on a different mm -hmm. level and so yeah it's definitely something that I feel very passionate about and will be a driving force for change is if we can bring people together in a different way to communicate in a different way and obviously it would be lovely to hear more about your experience of those dialogues that you had and whether you used phone dialogue or and what were the challenges that you faced in bringing people together with different views 
Well, Jessica, like you, I, I believe that listening is absolutely fundamental to the resolution and even the prevention of conflict, especially armed conflict. And um, it takes um, a real awareness and quite a degree of self-knowledge to listen well. You'll remember that Senator George Mitchell, who played a huge part in resolving the Northern Ireland uh, problems that we'd we'd used, we'd used military force to try and deal with for 30 years and then finally it was realized that dialogue was the only way and he said when he arrived I will listen for as long as it takes and, he did. Um, and I know from experience that there are different ways of listening and yes the bone dialogue is very good um, I'm more persuaded by NVC, nonviolent communication. Yeah. My other arm. <laughs> other arm. Um, and um, I realize that there's something deeper as well, that unless we have actually attended to our inner emotions about the subject under discussion mm. uh, and dealt with them, addressed them, resolved them inside ourselves, uh, it's always possible for the person that we're trying to open a dialogue with or persuade to detect what we are unconsciously projecting. Mm -hmm. And I know this because when I first started to arrange dialogues with nuclear weapons policy makers, it was unsuccessful. It really didn't work. And it didn't, I didn't learn until a bit later that the reason why was that I and my colleagues were still angry very angry about the development of nuclear weapons without parliamentary uh, uh, discussion. And secondly, um, fearful of uh, an accidental nuclear war, if not an intentional one. And it was only when I really learned to meditate and attend to my own inner um, deep, profound feelings, even unconscious feelings, um, that I was able to become conscious enough of them to, not to project them out onto those I was talking with or listening to. So I feel that these two things, um, self-knowledge, self-awareness, self-reflection, by any means that is appropriate to the individual, that could be a daily reflection practice, it could be um, yoga and physical um, calming of the self. It could be really profoundly alert walking in nature. It could be all sorts of things. It could be going and staying in a Buddhist monastery and getting really good at the practice. But some form of self-inspection in all the great peace builders that I know, and I work with literally hundreds of them now all over the world through Peace Direct, the second organization I started, that those who have done this inner work are the ones who are most effective in their outer work. So that's the first, for me, um, primary requisite um, in leadership, any kind of leadership that we have first um, really learned to sort ourselves out and understand ourselves and be um, charitable and kind to ourselves instead of constantly critical. Because um, most people, are, when I go to a meeting and I ask how many people have got an inner critic, every hand goes up in the room. So we need to attend to that. Uh, otherwise it just gets in the way. And then secondly, this question of really learning to listen. And when I teach um, corporate leaders about good communications, that's what I always start with. And I ask how many people in the room think that they are good listeners. And maybe 20, 20 hands go up or 30. And we discover that when we test it, that really very few people know how to listen deeply and by that I mean not hearing the other person but working out what the answer is or what we want to say or 
how they're completely arbitrary, um, making judgments and things like that, but actually listening in such a way that we could repeat back to them what they had just said. Mm. And not only that, but what the feelings were behind what they said. And so we test that over several hours and eventually work out what really good listening is. And what it means is being able to move from here, from my brain, which is I'm right and you're wrong, to the heart. And I listen to it and say, Goodness. That's how she feels. Because then I can begin to build a bridge across to your healing. And hopefully we would make it reciprocal. So you would be able to bridge to my feelings. And then we're in business for an agreement. Yeah. Then we're operating from the heart instead of the brain. Mm. Yeah. Makes it makes perfect perfect sense I do a lot of work around listening and MBC and I think with young people in particular I've been working with MBC and what's really powerful for me is that when you present them with the language of feelings and needs one they don't realize they have so many feelings and two they don't realize that they're even allowed to have needs and so that in itself is so revolutionary for how you exist in the world and how you respond to people or challenges because if you can start to tap into, oh, I feel this because I need this, or it changes everything. And, and I just always question why we don't teach these things to young people. You know. it, should be, it should be a part of the school curriculum from yeah. history school kids to take to it like ducks to water, they love it. Mm. And then they go out in the playground and stop bullying and stop the bullying that's going on. And then they teach their parents how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I think we're totally in agreement about that. Um, the other attri attribute of real leadership that I've um, covered at the shop end is present. Mm -hmm. um, now, present um, is only acquired uh, in very, very difficult life circumstances when you realise that the chips are down. Tom will know this from his military experience, that um, when you're in a situation where people are likely to be killed, how present you can be will say things. And I, do, you, do you know the story of Lieutenant Colonel Chris Hughes? No? I'll, you might do, I'll tell it to you quickly, because it's such a brilliant story. It illustrates such a lot about leadership. He was leading his men on a patrol in uh, in Najaf in Iraq just in 2003 shortly after the American invasion when you still could lead a foot patrol down the street and all of a sudden out of the mosques and the streets on either side of where they were um, this um, a huge crowd of furiously angry men swarmed down into the square where they were screaming and yelling in Arabic and of course the young men Young American men didn't understand Arabic, and they were terrified. And Chris Hughes immediately saw what was about to happen. And he strode right into the middle of the whole screaming throng, pointing his weapon at the ground, and gave his men an order they had never heard in their lives, kneel. And they wobbled to the ground in their heavy body armor and their backpacks and their helmets and put their weapon into the ground and slightly bowed their heads in complete silence. And after about two or three minutes, everybody went home. And nobody got killed. Could have been a massacre either way. And um, what he knew instinctively and in his presence was, was, was two things. First of all, that um, most, most armed conflicts are driven by humiliation. And the best and fastest antidote to humiliation is respect. Yeah. And what he did in that instant, having a very highly developed presence, 
was to give his men a command to show respect that saved probably hundreds of lives that day. And so um, I, I feel that presence is a very big part of leadership. Do you have any um, insights how, in how we can develop presence? I think it's very much what I referred to before, namely a daily practice of self-inspection. Um, because the more we can develop a helicopter view of ourselves and our actions on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. In other words, it's, it's like being on the balcony above and you can see what you're doing and what you're up to. And when you're doing something that your conscious mind wouldn't approve of or wouldn't like, like showing off or something like that, um, you can see it. So you develop this ability to observe as well as in, in the moment. And that uh, gives us the flash of a second that is sometimes necessary to solve a problem or find the right word in a crisis or, um, or even um, emanate the right kind of emotion. Mm. Uh, make people feel safer, whatever is necessary. So instead of just following what our wants and needs are, we're able to be conscious of the wants and needs of the room. Um, <clears throat> once when we had, in, in the nuclear weapons work, um, we eventually got to a point where we could invite um, key policymakers from all the nuclear nations to meet with their opposite numbers from other countries. You, you never heard about this because we did it all below the radar. Um, no press, no communication, um, no communiques even, and uh, always more or less undin always more or less deniable. And so one time we had a, um, a delegation of Chinese nuclear weapon policymakers who came as a result of a lot of work on our part to meet their British and American counterparts. And we had a public meeting on that occasion. And um, so it was, you know, it was a quite a dialectical sort of meeting in one of the Oxford colleges. And at one point it got quite heated and I could, and, and I was chairing it and so, um, I said at a certain point, I said, gentlemen, I wonder if we could just take a couple of minutes to absorb these very interesting points that we've heard. So what we will do now is we'll have two minutes complete silence. Thank you. And somewhat to my amazement, that's what happened. <laughs> and, um, and when we resumed, Everything was different. Mm. different because people had time to think, oh, should I have said that? Or I could really, mm, I wonder what he really meant. Mm. And then they started to ask each other more, uh, more pertinent questions as to what was really, what was really meant and what was going on. And we had a very, very successful outcome. Mm. <laughs> I feel a bit sort of humbled lis listening to you. I, I was very struck by one of the things you said on, on one of the videos I watched of you, where you were quoting someone saying, if, if, uh, if meditation was taught at school, then in 30 years there would be no war. Um, because to me, that was the Dalai Lama said that. <laughs> well, well, there you go. So I feel very frustrated. I feel frustrated that I can see the beauty in that, and I, and I feel the frustration that that's not happening. That although the, the little pockets, I, 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 I'm reminded of when I did some pro bono work in prisons some years ago, and it was producing amazing results. I, I, I remember in this particular um, institution, after about six months, the inmates put up a sign at the entrance to their wing saying, this is a drug-free zone. And 
not that long after that, we were thrown out uh, because the governor changed, the new one came in, and there was a lot of pressure from the doctors because they weren't able to control things using um, the, the suppressive drugs that they were had sort of normally used. So it felt like a very retrograde step. So you get these little flashes of, 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 of um, the light showing, and just the same way as you described, an amazing moment between Americans, Chinese, and uh, British, where just being asked to reflect in a new way, all sorts of great positivity. And yet we live in a world where it, 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 feels, it feels like we're going backwards more than we're going forwards. And mm. maybe it's just social media, maybe it's the news, the, the, not the last person, the person before that we were talking to is Mr. Positive, it was amazing. And he's involved in environmental uh, work and he's doing fantastic stuff. And because wh where he's working, he's, a, he's attracted and people are attracted to him. So there's a, a sort of a conjoining of positivity and he's making a fantastic difference. So you get these little pockets and yet, I. I, I don't know. I feel frustrated because it feels like things aren't going forward. And I, I hear you being so positive. Put me right. <laughs> I mean, Tom, I, I, I very much appreciate your feeling. And sometimes I feel that too. But I do believe that what we're on the cusp of is um, a potential, a po possible vast change in human consciousness um, and that's what we're going to need in order for humanity to survive because if we carry on this way it, it it's not gonna humanity not, the planet will go on quite happily but humanity will not survive and so we have to make what what einstein was referring to when he said you can't solve a problem from the consciousness that created so it's our job to up our level, not just a little bit, but a huge amount, to up our level of consciousness. And that's beginning to dawn, but we've still got some extremely sleepy people around. Um, we've got some clowns, we've got some, you know, archaic thinkers around, and that's normal. Um, but all we can, all, all those of us who are beginning to be alert to this can do is um, do our best to share what we know, to share our experience, to, to share it more and more at levels where it matters. Um, and that includes the armed forces who are now very, very alert to this. I'm very um, inspired by what's going on in some parts of the British Army training where they're actually using Gandhi as, you know, his, as a not as a model so much as using his scripts as teaching materials. Mm. Um, so, you know, great things are happening. Um, there's a wonderful um, book being produced called Understand to Prevent by the armies of six nations, and our nation is one of them. Um, and so th there's, there's lots going on, but uh, if you look at the daily news, you wouldn't think so, um, because as you rightly pointed out, Tom, the, the media um, lead with what bleeds. If it bleeds, it leads. And they're not so interested in telling stories of people like Chris Hughes or even the daily incredible work that's going on at grassroots level in the Congo, in Zimbabwe, in Pakistan, where huge, huge um, changes are being brought about by local people using their own courage, unnoticed and often unencouraged. So that's what Peace Direct does is to provide them with uh, media coverage, um, with capacity building and with small amounts of money to help them do what they do. Um, and these are, these are the unarmed heroes of our time. Well, I must say, um, what Greta Thunberg is doing really, really excites me. 
it, it really does. And uh, I, I love her rebelliousness and her, her, her stance, challenge. Her uncompromising uh, truth, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and just, it's such a, a graphic demonstration where um, you, you get people just saying, well, she should be in school. Uh, and it's like, wake up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> support all the British kids who are copying her now. I mean, it's great. Rather than saying they should be in school, no. They should be calling their leaders to account. Mm. That's what leadership is about. It's about participation. And to tell them they should shut up and go back to school is ridiculous. Mm. Utterly ridiculous. And it's the, it's the wrong direction. We should be encouraging our young people to uphold the standards that our leaders profess, but don't act on. I would um, quite like to bring in the feminine now, because in some respects, I think you can talk about these qualities and these attributes of a new leadership without attributing them to the feminine like listening and understanding and compassion and intuition but sometimes i think it's helpful to be explicit about things in in the, the hope that they solidify the understanding or make some sense on a feeling level but it i know that it doesn't resonate with everyone so i just wanted to put that out there first but i suppose for us and for me these qualities are they do come from the feminine they need to be very much supported by the masculine by you know that confidence and strength that we can draw on from our masculine but there are some that would say that we're out of balance in the world because we've been repressing the feminine so it's looking at our own kind of inner feminine and masculine but then within the cultural narrative of of how we view the feminine and so very often when you even bring up the feminine it's like oh but that's weak or it's see, perceived as negative so how do you feel about that in your work? Do you, are you explicit about talking about those qualities of leadership as feminine? I mean, I know that you have started your Rising Women, Rising World project. So this is something that weaves through your work as well. But could you just tell us a little bit more about it from your perspective? Well, first of all, I agree with every word you've just said, because I think it's um, a vital change that we're going through. Um, I, I like to get away from genderizing it. And so what we do is, is we call it feminine intelligence, mm. as Tom knows, available equally to men as it is to women. So it's not something that women are better at than men. Women are probably more trained to do some aspects of it, but men are just as good at, at those qualities you've enumerated um, when, they, when they put you know when they put their hearts and minds into it and so um feminine intelligence we call it fq as in iq eq fq and it's that intelligence that will um make our world safer if it can be adopted and not seen as weak and um uh, manipulable uh, so it needs to be accompanied by a lot of wisdom. Wisdom is the, the one that you left out, and I think it's key, that intelligence. So it's not simplistic, it's not naive, it's based on the, um, the ancient, divine, feminine wisdom that inspired the, the ancient goddesses before, before we invented male gods. Um, you know, the divine feminine was in place from 22,000 BC right through to about 5,000 BC. The, the, because women were seen to be magical because they could give birth. And the male participation in, um, in, in creating a new human being wasn't really realized until quite late. The first sculptures that show that only appeared about I think 13 12,000 BC and so for thousands of years women were considered to be the um, the 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 arch the, the the great power because they could do this magical thing give birth to a new human being which is what the human race obviously needed and so um 
during that time, um, the, the sculptures and the statues, and in some cases, the writings that survived later on, um, and particularly in great women sages like Julian of Norwich and so on, um, that wisdom has permeated and is now being retrieved by many, many women and men scholars. And the greatest of these at the moment actually is, is British. She lived, she's 86 now and she's written fantastic books about the divine feminine and bearing and all based on historical and archaeological finds. So um, that, that ingredient of wisdom, which as we all know, is, is not easy to acquire is hard earned. We have to constantly be learning. Our whole life is a wonderful unfolding of learning opportunity that will be presented to us when we're ready for them. Um, and from which we can then, learn. and so, you know, the biggest challenges that come our way and we go, oh no, 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 I can't deal with that. If we can actually walk towards what we fear, Walk towards what we fear in all respects, whether it's whether it's verbal violence or whatever it is. If we can walk towards it, especially our own inner violence, you know, the, the violence we do to ourselves. If we can walk towards that and uh, by facing it, transform it, then I think we're on the path of um, benefiting from all those life opportunities that we're given. Although at first we want to go, oh, no, no, not another one. I've got a lovely expression in, in the book that I wrote. I think it was ages ago. I wrote a book called Power and, Se Power and Sex. And in it, I describe an AFCO. Do you know what an AFCO is? Yeah. Another effing growth opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they say that the universe keeps on you the same lesson until you learn it. So. That's right. Exactly. So, Silla, there's stacks of questions I'd like to ask you, but perhaps it's important to, to look at where are you now and where are you going? What, what, what are your priorities? Where, where, where is um, your focus now? Thank you, Tom. Well, um, about two and a half years ago, I knew that I had to write another book because uh, over the years that I've spent working with some of the greatest people in conflict prevention and conflict resolution, I realized that we know enough now about what it costs to prevent armed conflict and to prevent war, that it's absurd that we don't um, write it down. So I worked out, I traced 25 tried and trusted methodologies for stopping or preventing armed conflict. Um, whether local or uh, international, and costed them um, because we do know how much they cost and over a 10 year period and added up all that that would cost. And of course, it wouldn't cover everything, but it would be a start. And the total came to $2 billion, only $2 billion. Whereas we spend $9 billion a year on ice cream. And the militarization of the world costs $1,739 billion right now. It's absurd. It's utterly absurd that we're not um, developing prevention budgets for all our armed forces, because many of them would like that. And once there's a budget, then the armed forces will be trained in prevention because they're very good at it. Um, all sorts of measures that I recommend in the book, it's called the business plan for peace, um, that we could take with very minimal expense, building architectures for peace in countries at risk of civil war, just as Mandela did successfully in South Africa. You know, I lived in South Africa for 10 years and we were absolutely certain there was going to be civil war when he came out of jail. But he and his colleagues carefully planned a structure in the country, which is 
which they called the National Peace Council, which operated at all levels, national, city, region, town, and village peace councils, where those who were on the councils, always locally respected people, um, had to develop a peace plan for their area that they could put into action the mean minute that violence threatened. And it was. People did get killed, but there was no civilian. And that's what other countries are now thinking of adopting. But they need encouragement. And I, I guess one of the things that works against that is, is because people make money out of war. Uh, and a, a, an awful lot of the decision makers and politicians either wittingly or unwittingly um, are very much involved in that in that uh, in that side absolutely so uh, how how do you go about challenging or chipping away or penetrating that in some way uh, largely through uh, in my way of thinking through divestment if you look at what happened with fossil fuel divestment when the big the massive investment houses realized that their clients could actually make more money out of renewables than they could out of fossil fuels the whole thing began to change um, and now that's the norm you know it, it, it's considered stupid to invest in fossil fuels um, and uh, because renewables are much more profitable uh, quite apart from the fact that you know that's the way to have a safer planet so what we're looking at very carefully is what are the potential incentives for divestment from weapon production? Because if you, can, if you can stop the supply, and as you rightly say, stop the enormous amounts of money that are made through weapons trading and weapons production, then maybe you begin to, uh, well, you definitely would begin to tilt the emphasis in other directions but we haven't yet um we're just building at the moment we're building the case for it you talk in one of your talks about um asking people what breaks your heart and what are your skills what breaks your heart and what are your skills <laughs> um what breaks my heart are um children going to sleep afraid and waking up unsafe uh, when it's not necessary. But what breaks my heart are huge, huge numbers of people on the move because they can no longer stay where their homes are. They can't continue to grow their crops because of climate change or because of um, conflict. And so they're becoming migrants and what we're seeing now in the way of migration is nothing compared to what we're going to see. We have to stop it. We have to stop the reasons for it. Uh, so I think those are, it's the, the terrifying experience for children of armed conflict, um, which marks them for life um, and takes a lot of work to undo. And then this, um, shameful, shameful columns of people on the move and then being forced to live in the most terrible conditions as migrants. Um, and that breaks my heart. What are my skills? Um, I think my skills are um, research. I'm, I'm always keen that we have the facts at our fingertips before we try to develop dialogue with anybody. Um, constant learning um, and um, constant self questioning, in other words, self inspection, I would say. Um, and my skill is now dealing with my inner critic. I've now, I, over years of being woken up at three o'clock in the morning by terrible accusing voices saying, you're going to fall flat on your face tomorrow. You haven't prepared. Um, you know, really, you're a waste of time and you're a fraud. That's what my inner critic would say, or worse. And so um, I got fed up with it. 
and I started to wake up, get up, make a cup of tea and set out two cushions and develop a dialogue with mm -hmm. this um, ferocious voice. And he took the form of a dragon. And I realized that the dragon had a diamond underneath his left floor. And I needed to know what that was, because it was for me. And he was guarding it. And so I had to negotiate with him and get in communicate in dialogue with him to um, get access to that diamond. And, and now I'm pleased to say, with occasional lapses, he is my friend. <laughs> I suppose we haven't really spoken much about power dynamics and how they're always present and how if we walk, like you said, we have to walk towards the thing that we're most afraid of. But how can we get better, I suppose, at naming power dynamics when because, you know, we can only walk towards the thing that we acknowledge is there and sometimes the power dynamic is not acknowledged. So what can we all do to acknowledge the unhelpful, harmful power dynamic? I'm sure you and you would know this as much as anyone. It's to, it's to spot it, you know, to become conscious of it. As soon as you know that you're being um, insulted, very politely or you're being um, marginalized or reduced in some way or belittled very subtly sometimes and you can quietly name it and say it has to be in the first person you know, when you make that remark i feel quite sad and quite angry to name what's going on and to ask, make a request of the person and uh, not to treat you like that. Um, in the bigger form of things, I think um, it needs um, a, a revision of the values and the communications norm of a company or a house of commons or a military regiment. In other words, that they're comes an agreement between the leaders and those they're working with of what their values are and write them down and then you can call people on it and say we agreed not to communicate in that way and we agreed to communicate in this way and then you've got you've got handholds that you can use what would you think well, you said another magic word for me, which is values. I am a member of the UK Values Alliance. I do a lot of dialogues around values. Um, and I think, yeah, for me, the thing with values is that we can't just name them. We have to give meaning to them and we have to acknowledge that perhaps we have slightly different meaning for the same value. And so again, it, it needs to be in a process of dialogue and coming together and sharing what that means and um, using mm -hmm creativity maybe to engage people but finding spaces and opportunities to really increase the discourse and values to connect people to their values and to show them that if you live from a place of your values it changes how you make decisions and how you see people and so yeah for me values are a very under like what's the word value undervalued <laughs> at all for changing culture and changing behavior and again something that hopefully can be increased in schools I know there are great charities that are working to embed values based uh, lessons in curriculum so and again something that leaders can help by living their values talking about their values actually them, but in a way that's meaningful and it's not just a superficial oh yes I believe in truth and honesty but I don't really know what that means and I don't really know how I live it because we know that there is a value action gap and we have to look actually more importantly on what is causing the gap. Yeah, we, and we have to be very precise about what that means. I totally agree with you. Mm. And I, I, I hold out a lot of um, hope in, in the way that I notice millennials are expressing their values and making demands. And so rightly should they. And, um, and if they, if do, in doing that, they can stand up to established cultures 
and one of the hardest to crack is going to be our political maneuverings and way of doing things. Mm. But young younger people coming up and saying, "I won't stand for that. I'm not. I'm not going to be in this company or this outfit if that is the values you subscribe to. I'm out of here. Mm. Uh, if you won't change them." So. Um, I think another great quality of um, what you were talking about, the attributes of feminine intelligence, is knowing how to take a stand in a way that doesn't provoke more resistance. Um, and that's, it, it sounds like a detail, but it's terribly important because it goes back to what I said at the beginning, really, is if I, take, if, if I stand up and berate you angrily for not having a company with the values that I will subscribe to, you're just going to defend. You're going to say, well, okay, leave or whatever you're going to say. But if I can take that stand in such a way that my, my feet are really planted firmly on the ground and my head is fairly straight so that I'm connected um, to the infinite and to the earth and trust in my gut feeling to say what I need to say without edge and without without um, accusation and punishing, but just to say what it feels like and what my request would be. We're back to NBC. Um, it, it's much more likely to um, make a stand which is going to make a change, not provoke resistance. Yeah, yeah, it, it reminds me of the pedagogy of the oppressed that we have to liberate through love so we can take our stand but still love everyone as an equal human being in spite of their behaviour or choices. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've come to the end. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, it's been wonderful talking with you and learning from you. I so admire what you've done and what you are, are doing. It's been a great pleasure talking to you both and, <clears throat> and learning how you feel this works. And I'm full of admiration for what you're doing. And let me know how it progresses. <laughs> well, we shall. And when, when, when this podcast is released, we'll, we'll obviously let you know. So. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much.